Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of America Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang, as we continue on this Red River Red campaign. River. Red River. <laughs> <laughs> we continue on this Red River campaign of them trying to take Shreveport from the Confederates. Ooh. As well as we have another battle that is the Camden campaign, or expedition they call it, which is... They were trying to merge together to right. kind of encircle the place, but mm-hmm. as we already know, it doesn't work out very good. But we still got to we still got to learn about them. We got the Battle of Blair's Landing, which deals with the Red River Campaign. The Battle of Salyersville, which is in Kentucky, a little different. And then we end with Poison Spring, which is part of the Camden Expedition. Right. Before that, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Shorts, clips, exclusives, our exclusive Dart League that's going on as we speak, and go. Comment on our Spotify. Give us a review. Apple. All right. Uh, Battle Bears Landing coming up first, April 12th, 1864, which saw Confederate Cavalry Artillery Force, commanded by Brigadier General Tom Green, RIP. You'll see. Uh, he attacked Union gunboats, led by Rear Admiral David Porter and his soldiers in river transports under Brigadier General Thomas Kilby Smith in Red River Parish, Louisiana. Mm. President Abraham Lincoln and Major General Henry Halleck wanted a Union Army to establish a foothold in Texas by way of the Red River. All right. Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, who was commander of the Department of the Gulf, was ordered to organize an expedition in cooperation with Major Generals William T. Sherman and Frederick Steele. Oh. While Steele moved south from Little Rock with 15,000 troops, bang, bang. <laughs> <laughs> Banks moved in two columns. Oh, fantastic. 17,000 strong columns ascended by you, Tetch. And joined 10,000 men that came up the Red River under General Major General Andrew Jackson Smith to occupy Alexandria, Louisiana on the 18th of March, year 1864. Red River was, uh, the Red River force was on loan from Sherman and accompanied by 13 ironclads and seven light draft gunboats from Porter's uh, Mississippi River Squadron. Okay, look at that. Nice. After A.J. Smith's force won two minor Actions at Fort De Russy on the 14th of March. Did we didn't get that, did we? Sure did. Did we do Fort De Russy? Mm-hmm. Nah, I don't think we did. We did. And also Henderson's Hill on the 21st of March. Banks' army started marching upriver and reached Natchitoches on the 2nd of April, year 1864. Sure did. Meanwhile, Porter started upriver with six gunboats and T.K. Smith's division of the 17th Corps board transport. They planned to meet with Banks' army at Springfield Landing, which was 110 miles below Shreveport. Oh, However, Major General Richard Taylor, who's a Confederate, oh. <laughs> he drubbed the Union Army at the Battle of Mansfield. Yes, he did. On April 8th, forcing Banks to retreat. Reinforced now, Taylor attacked Banks again at the Battle of Pleasant Hill on April 9th, but it was also repulsed. Oh, but damn. he was repulsed, right? right? Nevertheless, Banks withdrew to Grand E Corps near Natchitoches on the Red River. Well, that didn't quite work out for the guy, did sure it? Didn't. April 7th, Porter, T.K. Smith, they left Grand E Corps and headed upstream on the old Red River. Porter, he commanded the gunboats, U.S. Cricket, U.S. Ch- Chillicothe, and USS um, Fort Hindman, also USS Lexington, <laughs> USS Neosho, and USS Osage. Osage. Right. Uh, the last two being monitors. They were. Which was Neosho and Osage. Uh, <laughs> that would have been the last two. Yeah. Right. Uh, there were also several auxiliary vessels as well. T.K. Smith, he led 2,500 Union soldiers on 20 river boats, um, river transports. Oh, just like little. Transports, man. <laughs> right. Water level in the river was low, right. causing the naval vessels to proceed at a slow pace. That very day, the expedition reached Campty, where it briefly landed a regiment to clear the town and anchored for the night. He's like, you go clear that town while we anchor. We're going to anchor. April 8th, the expedition reached Cushada Point. Where it anchored for the night. <laughs> 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 Colonel Lyman M. Wards, is too close to Hyman, but right. uh, his brigade was sent ahead by land to chase away a Confederate force reported three miles farther ahead at Cushada Chute. Right. So there's a point in a chute of Cushada. Right. April 9th, the vessels advanced as far as Nine Mile Bend before anchoring for the evening. All right. April 10th, the expedition reached the mouth of Loggy Bayou, which was near Springfield Landing, where they found the Confederate sank the riverboat New Falls City loaded with bricks and mud athwart the channel. Oh. Huh? While they pondered what to do, a courier arrived from Banks saying his army was defeated and fallen back to Grand E Corps. Oh. Porter and T.K. Smith decided to obey Banks' verbal instructions to return to Grand E Corps as well. They're like, well, shit. Right. Came all the way up here for nothing. You ain't kidding. The warships, other vessels, they were unable to turn around because the river was so narrow. 
So they had all had to back down the river with the, with the last vessel in the lead. Going backwards. Yeah. By the morning of 11th of April, 1864, after working all night, the ships were all able to turn around and proceed down river. Bow first. Bow. Yep. <laughs> By this time, groups of Confederates on the East Bank under Brigadier General St. John Richardson Liddell, he peppered the expedition with rifle fire. To which the warships replied with cannon fire. <laughs> Don't bring rifle fire there again. <laughs> cannon fire. Right. Uh, that day, the sound of my pillows too. Right. right. <laughs> that day, <laughs> that's his great great grandpa. <laughs> he was like, "Here's this pillow stuffed with uh, genuine duck feathers." <laughs> that day, the Chillicoth ran hard aground in mid afternoon and was not freed for several hours. The expedition anchored for the night at Cushata Shoot, having received written orders from Banks to proceed to Grand Ecor. Oh. Yes. Late afternoon, April 12th, the expedition reached Blair's Landing. Several vessels were damaged by, damaged by snags, logs, oh, tree snags. stumps, <laughs> collisions, and sandbanks as the river stage fell. I bet. The transport Hastings was tied up to the West Bank to make repairs. Hey. The transport Alice, Vivi, Alice Vivian, loaded with 400 horses, was, damn, one of those horses got spooked. Right. Was hard aground in midstream with the Osage uh, ground right behind her. Jeez. Oh, the sucks. transport Rob Roy was behind both, unable to pass. All right. What can you do? The transport Blackhawk was lashed just alongside the Osage, and the Lexington was near the East Bank. Okay. All but five of the river transports had made it safely downstream. Mm -hmm. They got soldiers on them now. They got to get out. All right. After the old ribs set back at Pleasant Hill, Taylor, he met with his well, superior. That's supposed to be red. <laughs> right. Taylor met with his superior, General Edmund Kirby Smith, who decided to take most of the infantry north to fight Steele's federal force in Arkansas. Kirby Smith, he left Taylor with about 5,200 troops to face Banks. He feared that Steele might reach the old rebel supply base at Shreveport, Louisiana. Kirby Smith was convinced that if Taylor had more soldiers, he would not be able to feed them in the desolated country between Mansfield and Alexander. He's like, I don't know what to tell you, but can you, we can't do it. Can't do it. Taylor tried to argue, but he was overruled. He's like, overruled. How do you think they said it back then? So you're going and that's an order, <laughs> right. probably. Nevertheless, Taylor still believed that he could destroy Banks. Okay, so army. why are you crying about All it? Right. Morning of April 10th, Brigadier General Hamilton PB's cavalry rode to Pleasant Hill and found that Banks' army had abandoned the battlefield and was in full retreat. Hmm. B gave chase, but the Federals burned double bridge, stop in pursuit. All right. Dawn on April 11th, Taylor ordered Colonel Arthy P. Arthy, <laughs> <laughs> Arthur P. Bagby Jr. to intercept Porter's expedition at Grand Bayou Landing. Right. Bagby was delayed in crossing the 330-foot-wide Bayou Pier and only reached Grand Bayou Landing after Porter's vessels had passed. Mm. After being notified of the situation, Taylor ordered Green to intercept Porter instead. He said, Green, you go. Do it. Do it now. 6 p.m., 11th of April, 1864. Green set out with regiments of Colonels William Henry Parsons, Nicholas Gold, and Peter Woods as the 12th Texas, 23rd Texas, and the 36th Texas Cavalry Regiments, respectively. Mm -hmm. And he also had two artillery batteries. With difficulty, Green crossed by Pierre at Jordan's Ferry, getting only three cannons across, and rushed his horsemen forward in an all-night march. Yes. Right. The very next day, 12th of April, in the afternoon, Green arrived at Blair's Plantation with about 1,000 soldiers. Captain John A. West's Gross Tete. <laughs> tet. Gross Tet Flying Artillery, which was Louisiana's. Arthur W. Bergeron Jr., he stated that only the battery's 12-pound howitzer section was present during the action. Cool. Thanks, Arthur. <laughs> right. uh, Green assigned Parsons to take charge of the attacking force, while Brigadier General James Patrick Major commanded a small reserve. Okay. Parsons led his dismounted cavalrymen to the trees on the bluff overlooking the riverbank. Oh. This movement was spotted by the pilot of the Black Hawk, who alerted the other vessels. Really? Lieutenant Thomas Oliver Selfridge, Jr., who commanded the Osage, ordered the Lexington, Lexington into action. In response, Lieutenant George M. Bach, or Bosch, moved the Lexington towards the river's edge, eight-inch guns blazing, disabling one Confederate gun. At this, uh, at this, Green's cavalrymen opened a terrific blast of small arms fire at the Union vessels. Oh. What are your little small arms going to do? Right. Mm, the Union infantry aboard transports fired back while she did, while shielded by cotton bales and sack of oats. A section of the guns on the transport Emerald, the howitzer aboard the Black Hawk, and four heavy parrot rifles on the Rob Roy added to the fire directed at Green's dismounted troopers. The guns in Union infantry were first landed on the east bank before they came into action. The Confederate battery fired on the Hastings, but at first shot fell short. 
as the Hastings quickly steamed away. Like, oh, shit. Like, oh, damn. <laughs> uh, more missed shots passed overhead. Yeah, despite the huge volume of small arms fire from both sides, casualties were relatively light. Right. The Confederates were protected by the river's high bank, while the Federals were helped by their improvised defenses. Mm. The fire finally became so intense that the crew and passengers of the Black Hawk took refuge aboard the Osage. Why? Right. Porter later remarked that there was not a place six inches square that was not perforated by bullets. Oh. Okay. On the Black Hawk, that was. The Osage worked itself free of the sandbar and moved towards the West Bank, firing her 11-inch guns. Oh. Its gunners soon ran out of canister shot and grape shot, so they substituted shrapnel shell with one-second fuses. Oh. oh geez. One-second fuses? You go... Yeah, you're... Get the hell out of the way. Ooh-wee. The Confederate artillery horses were moited, forcing the men to manhandle their guns into new positions. When the Union gunboats found the range, the Neosho appeared, and together with the Lexington and Fort Hinman, Blasted the West Bank with canister and grape shot for two miles. Wow. At the same time, the Alice Vivian drifted off the shoal, which meant that the fleet could now continue downriver. It's like, we get the hell out of here. The Confederate guns were out of action, so Green decided to charge the vessels. Okay, oh. good. <laughs> this might have been possible it's, because... It's Normandy backwards. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> this might have been possible because some of the vessels were in water only shoulder deep to a horse. Yeah. To a horse. Yeah, but... Come on. That's right. just stupid. You're going to get know. picked off. Right. No way I'm going into water. Stuck towards a boat dumb. Full of soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, one Texan wrote that Green was a man who, when out of whiskey, was a mild-mannered gentleman. Oh. But when in good supply of old burst head, was all fight. <laughs> oh. Well, he must be Irish. Maybe, right? <laughs> Perhaps made reckless from alcohol intake, Green yelled at the men of uh, Woods' regiment that he was going to show them how to fight. Aboard the Osage, Selfridge saw an officer on a white horse on the riverbank and had a cannon fired at him, after which the man disappeared. Oh. Unfortunately, that man was Tom Green, and he was killed by an artillery projectile that took the top of his head off. Oh, dude. Damn, showing him how to fight, huh? At least he was drunk, probably didn't feel it. Man. <clears throat> I, mean, I don't care if he was drunk or anything. Well, feeling you weren't it. feeling it anyways, right? Wow. The last action, hero... <laughs> the action lasted about an hour, ending at dusk, when the Union expedition got underway. And the Confederates, they're gone. They were out of here. Let's go. <laughs> we got to have a head. Uh, <laughs> oh, what was that? The old headless horseman it over there. It was an old burst head. <laughs> <laughs> old burst head. <laughs> old burst head was all fun. Yeah, this head bursting, that's for sure. Right. Wow. Though both sides believed that they had inflicted heavy losses on their opponents. In fact, losses were relatively light. T.K. Smith, he left his dead and wounded in the hands of the old rebels. Gosh. Taylor wrote that Green's loss was irreparable one. Irreparable. Right. <laughs> um, and Green was replaced by a B. <laughs> Green was replaced by B as the commander of Taylor's cavalry. Oh, well, yeah. It's like no a song. Ch- had no choice. <laughs> the National Park Service listed 60 Union and 57 Confederate casualties. That night, the Union expedition traveled downstream until 1 a.m. when it anchored for the night. Major led the Confederate cavalry from Blair's Landing back to Pleasant Hill. April 13th, the uh, transport John Warner went hard aground, forcing the expedition to halt its progress. Liddell set up two sections of pillows. <laughs> Liddell set up two sections. Made from, made from slave hair. <laughs> There's high-quality slave hair right here, I tell you what. <laughs> Liddell set up two sections of six-pounder guns on a high bluff at Bolado's Point. And proceeded to fire on the Union fleet from the East Bank. Wow. All right. One section belonged to Captain Archibald J. Cameron's Louisiana battery. The distance was too great. Caliber guns too small to do any damage. Nevertheless, fearing that a lucky shot might set off an ammunition explosion, Porter and T.K. Smith sent most of the vessels downriver, headed by the transport of the Sioux City. At the very same time, the Assage fired at Liddell's guns, silencing them. Hearing the expedition was in trouble, Bank Senate A.J. Smith, the phenomenal one, with two <laughs> brigades, two batteries, and some cavalry to the East Bank at 4 p.m. on the 13th of April. After a 12-mile march, these troops reached Camp T, wherever that is, found, found most of the fleet and drove away Liddell's forces. Upstream, the Fort Hinman finally succeeded in pulling the John Warner free. Meanwhile, the transport Iberville grounded near Camp T, and the John Warner stopped to help. These last two stragglers caught up to the rest of the expedition at Grand Ecor April 16th. Hmm. A witness recalled the expedition's vessels were riddled and their smokestacks looked like pepper boxes. Damn. When they left Campty, A.J. Smith's troops burned the town to the ground. They said, oh. screw you, 
talking about our right. smokestacks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dang, dude, our dude's head got chopped in half. Yeah, he did. Oh, well, goodness. Mark, not even uh, the top. A little part. more brutal than chopped. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, that's, that's a battle for you. <laughs> Man. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> All I can picture is that scene from uh, Twister. When they're in the... Uh, when the little uh, flying... The, the, the uh, hubcap. Hubcap, yeah. It's that dude on forehead. You'll it's basically... Be all, what, you'll be all right. All right. You'll be all right. No, he's going to die. It's like, I'm going home, Bailey. She needs you more than I do. <laughs> it was you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's right in front of you. All along. <laughs> Uh, oh, R.I.P. <laughs> right. <laughs> battle of Saliersville. Actually, that last battle was pretty good. One. That was all right. Battle of Saliersville, also called the Battle of Ivy Point Hill. Not to be confused with the Battle of Ivy Mountain, obviously not, because it's Ivy Point Hill, <laughs> <laughs> which took place in April of 1861. We did that one, I believe. Of course we did. Yeah, also uh, called the Battle of Half Mountain, and it was the largest of many skirmishes in McGoffin County, Kentucky, during the Civil War of the well, Americans. Good for them. Year 1864, April. Confederate Colonel Ezekiel F. Clay led his regiment of mounted infantry on a road to Kentucky. I think that's a movie, right? Road raid to Kentucky. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Even that, that right. uh, on a raid to Kentucky. On a road as well. <laughs> a road to the raid. <laughs> <laughs> he was opposed by the forces of the sub district of Eastern Kentucky under Union Colonel George W. Gallup, consisting of the 14th Kentucky Infantry and the 39th Kentucky Infantry, and reinforcements under Colonel C. J. True, consisting of the 40th Kentucky and the 11th Michigan. Those are Michigan boys in there. Uh, it's the Michigan Cavalry. Mm-hmm. April 13th, 1864, the Confederates attacked the Union position at Paintsville, but Colonel Gallup's 750 men held their position. April 14th, Clay and his exhausted troops and horses were trying to rest near the mouths of the Punchian and Little Half Mountain Creeks. Colonel Clay didn't think Colonel Gallup would pursue him, mm. but that turned out to be a costly misjudgment. Yep. Some believe that Gallup was led by a young laid, a young lad, I guess, from Punchian named Lade. Oh, Lade would be a girl. Uh, Punchian named Liza Whitaker through oh. Ivyton and down Gun Creek to Brush Brushy Fork. Okay. Colonel Gallup split his... Okay, good for Liz Liza Walt Whitaker. Right. Was she like the Sacagawea to uh, yeah. <laughs> Gallup? <Yeah. laughs> Colonel Gallup split his troops at Brushy Creek, sending 300 with Orlando Brown down the ridge of Little Half Mountain while leading the rest down the Fred Risner Branch. Is this supposed to be a ranch? Right. <laughs> but they serve breakfast. Right. <laughs> it's a breakfast ranch. Yeah. Called a branch. Yeah. <laughs> and a move that trapped. Right. Breakfast right. and lunch. So a branch. You can brunch. <laughs> this, this move trapped Colonel Clay and his troops. Colonel Gallup was assisted by Colonel John S. Dills, Colonel David A. Mims, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Meek Furfison. Don't know if that's supposed to be a G, but whatever kind of name is Furfison. Right. Uh, Lieutenant E.J. Roberts, Acting Assistant Adjutant General Colonel Orlando Brown, and Captain John C. Collins, who claims to have shot Clay. Well, oh. we know Clay gets shot. Oh, wow. <laughs> Near the end of this battle, Clay was shot. Through the eye, and had to remove himself from the battle. He's lucky he didn't, he didn't remove himself from right. life. <laughs> I'm about to remove myself from life, guys. <laughs> Peace out. Uh, Colonel Clay threw the eye and he survived. Huh? All right, he was eventually captured and taken to an Ohio prison by Elijah Patrick, where he was finally pardoned by President Lincoln near the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Clay refused to accept the pardon and waited for the war to end to gain his freedom. Look at him. CSA suffered casualties of 60 men, 200 horses. 400 saddles, 300 small arms were taken as well. Ooh. The United States sustained only slight losses. That's a lot of, uh, yeah. Oh, well, nothing compared to what uh, the unit have lost during this Red River campaign. Crazy amounts. Which we're about to see more. We got the Battle of Poison Spring. Rounding out this episode, which was fought in Owachita County, Arkansas, on April 18, 1864, as part of that Camden expedition. All right. A unit force commanded by Major General Frederick Steele had moved from Little Rock towards Shreveport, Louisiana, in support of Major General Nathaniel Banks' move up the Red River. Low on supplies, he sent approximately 1,100 men under the command of Colonel James Williams on April 17th to search for food. He said, do we need some food? Ooh, baby. 
They're going to go any town they come across. They're pillaging and raping women. Yes. <laughs> Maybe not the last part. Definitely the first part. Maybe. Williams's command consisted of the 1st Kansas Infantry, which were colored. The 18th Iowa Infantry, which are whiteies. <laughs> <laughs> Four black cannons. <laughs> they probably were. And elements of several cavalry regiments. Elements. <laughs> Just a little know. bit. A little got, bit of some. A little bit of cavalry. We got a, we got a saddle over here. <laughs> <laughs> there's a... There's a there's what do they call the harness for the horse over there? Right. There's yeah. a, uh, a horseshoe for some reason. <laughs> some oats. The Confederates learned of the supply train and sent a force composed of Marmaduke's cavalry. He's a pretty good guy. Or, I don't know about a good guy, but <laughs> he's, he's, he's been a pretty good a little uh, general yeah. yeah, for these guys. And also a brigade commanded by Brigadier General William L. Cabell. This force was later augmented by Maxey's uh, Confederate division. Given the old Rebs, a total strength about 3,000. <laughs> Given the old Rebs, a total strength about 35 hondo. Uh, Marmaduke had been in command of the force, but as Maxi had seniority over Marmaduke, Maxi took overall command. The Confederate battle plan was to block the path of the wagon train with Marmaduke and Cabell's troops, and then Maxi's division would take the halted train in the flank. As planned, Williams' force was blocked by Marmaduke and Cabell April 18th and Maxie's division composed of a brigade under Texans under uh, Colonel Charles DeMorse and Walker's Native Americans oh. hit the flank of Williams' column. However, Maxie's initial assault was repulsed by the first Kansas who was colored. Right. The uh, next Confederate charge was more coordinated with Marmaduke and Maxie attacking the Union force simultaneously. Ooh, right. shit. After a fight about an hour, Maxie's men were again forced to retreat. But the Union soldiers began to run low on ammo. Sure did. Third Rebel charge broke the flank of the Union position. The first Kansas, which are colored, they abandoned the position. Oh, first leave, huh? Probably ran out of ammo. I wouldn't stay either. Right. Fixed bayonets, baby. The 18th Iowa attempted to form a second line, but was quickly driven off by the old Rebel assault. The African-American soldiers of the first Kansas, which were colored, were showed no quarter. Of course they were. Oh, no. After what we just had at the... Uh Little massacre, right. Fort Pillow. Many of the members of the Kansas regiment who fell into Confederate hands were killed and mutilated. Wow. Some observers reported that Walker's Choctaws took scalps from dead Union soldiers. Oh, they did. Walker would later write, the train fell into our hands, and soon a portion of his artillery, which my troops found concealed in a thicket near the train. I feared here that the train and its contents would prove a temptation too strong for these hungry, half-clothed Choctaws, but I had no trouble in pressing them forward, for there was that in front. And to the left, more inviting to them than food or clothing, which were the blood of their despised enemies. They had met and routed the forces of General Thayer, the ravagers of their country, the despoilers of their homes, and the murderers of their women and children. Oh, my. Oh, my. As if the rebels did anything better to the Indians when they right, fought them. Right. Get out of here. They're both some savages. Williams's Union column lost about 301 men. Not about exactly 301 <laughs> men. The first Kansas, which was colored, lost 182 men out of 438 who had participated in the battle. 117 and 182 losses in the Kansas regiment were moited, which was unusually high kill-to-wounded ratio. Yeah, it is. Uh, I wonder why. Right. In comparison, the old Rebs lost 114 men. The old Rebels also captured four cannons and 175 wagons. 175 wagons. Ooh, we. Within the wagons were 5,000 bushels of corn and non-military items such as furniture and civilian clothing. Jeez. Um, a week later, April 25th, another Union wagon train was captured at the Battle of Marks Mills. Mm. With his forces lack of supplies, especially food, becoming increasingly problematic, Steele decided to give up on his campaign and withdraw from Camden. Oh, wow. Some Confederate forces that had been shifted south to fight banks were returned to Arkansas. The now strengthened Confederate force pursued Steele and caught up with the Union soldiers while they were trying to cross the Saline River. Uh oh. April 30th, the Confederates attacked Steele's position near the river in the Battle of Jenkins Ferry, which we uh, will have. As we will. The very site of the battlefield is preserved within Poison Springs Battleground State Park, which is part of the Camden Expedition Sites National Historical Park. <laughs> Land park. <laughs> Camden Expedition Sites National Historic Landmark. The state park is located 12 miles from Camden, Arkansas. And includes 84 acres of battlefield. Can you walk that 84 acres? I would assume so. That'd be badass field. The Camden Expedition Sites National Historic Landmark, which includes the Poison Spring Battleground as well as right. other sites related to Steele's campaign, right. is listed on the National Register of Historic Places in the year 1994. Good for them. Right. <clears throat> well, 
We well, had a little decent battle. Uh, the Rebs had to win that one, right? Yes, sir. Obviously. <laughs> it's going to wrap up these three battles in this episode. Uh, coming up next week, I don't think we're done with the Red River campaign because we got the Battle of Monnet's Ferry, which is definitely part of the Red River campaign. Just is. Oh, we got a lot left in uh, Red River campaign. Yeah. We got Alexandria, Mansur, Yellow Bayou, plus in Arkansas. That was all in Louisiana, plus in Arkansas. We still got Marks Mills and Jenkins Ferry. Hmm. That's a decent little one. We'll probably have that. I do. Marks Mills, like I said. That's a decent one. Right. And most likely the Battle of Jenkins Ferry, for sure. Oh, yeah. That's oh. be the three of them. Oh, yeah. We got the Battle of... Uh, Monnet's Ferry, Battle of Mark's Mills, and the Battle of Jenkins Ferry coming up right. next. Monet, Monet. Uh, we. I was going to say, are we ever going to go back to freaking Virginia and them? Right, we we will on the next episode after that because we'll be in South Car- or North Carolina and then Virginia for the Battle of the Wilderness. Ooh, wee. Uh, yeah, the Battle of the Wilderness is going to be its own episode. So yeah. maybe we'll have to sneak in the Battle of Albert Mail. Elba Marl Sound in North Carolina on next week's episode as well. Possible. Well, we're gonna have to. <laughs> if the Battle of the Wilderness is gonna be by itself. You yeah, know? Nope. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. Maybe we'll squeeze in Port Hall, Hall Junction at the end right. of the wilderness too. Oh, yeah. All right. And then we got a battle that we'll never be able to pronounce, the Calcaso Pass. So <laughs> The Calcio Pass. The Calcasio. Calcaso Pass. Calcaso, I bet Spotsylvania Courthouse should be a decent one as well. And oh. it will be. Oh, we got some big battles coming up. Wilderness. Buddy. Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse. Oh, buddy, I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. And the Battle of Court Harbor, I believe, was a pretty decent one as well. And it is. Oh, we got some good ones coming up. 1864 is not as d- 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 disappointing as it's has been so far. But that'll be a few episodes from now. We'll be back next week for three more battles. Remember, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Give us a like and review on Spotify, Apple. Back next week for more battles of the Mega Civil War. We are the Mouth of Michiganers with Bang Dang.